It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. In this episode, I'm talking to Ashley May Hoyland. She's the author of the Maxwell Institute's newest book, 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly. The book is part of the Maxwell Institute's Living Faith series, but it's unlike any other book in that series. Ash May joins us in this episode to read excerpts from the book and talk a little bit about how it came to be. We're joined today by Ashley May Hoyland. She's the author of a new book from the Maxwell Institute called 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly. Ashley May Hoyland, but I call you Ash May. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's good to have you. So we're talking about this book, and I should let people know from the beginning that this is part of the Maxwell Institute's Living Faith series, and I'm the co-editor of that series. And so I've been involved in this book from beginning to end, so this is a little bit different than most of the interviews I do where I, I don't know the authors and I'm not involved in it. So, But I'm really glad to be doing this. And Ashme, you just sort of got back from a little whirlwind tour of book events. You just did a ton of book events. I did. And I guess the basic idea is you take the book and um, people could pick up copies of the book, but you'd also spend time reading from the book and talking a little bit about how you wrote it and that sort of thing. Yeah. So originally I was pretty anxious about the idea of standing up and reading my book in front of people, um, in part because I don't love being in the spotlight and in large part because I have never been able to read my own work aloud without my voice shaking really badly. And so I thought, there's no way that I'm going to stand up um, 20 times and have my voice shake and be emotional in front of all those people. But it turns out it was actually not that way. People were really, really gracious. um, And I knew that I wanted it to not just be about me. I knew I wanted the book events to be conversational. And I wanted them all to carry a different energy that the audience was offering. Um, So all the events ended up being totally different. I read different pieces, um, we talked about different things, and it, it felt like a very generative spiritual experience to me each time. Yeah, we thought it would be kind of cool in this interview to kind of do a, something similar where we'll have you read uh, some pieces and sort of talk about them. So let's start sure. with the title, however, here, uh, 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly. Talk about talk about the title a little bit. Um, I've always loved birds. I don't know... Like, uh, so I'm also a visual artist, I'm a painter, and for the longest time, actually still, always, all of my paintings would have kind of a lot of stuff going on at the bottom of the painting. They would be these long vertical paintings, and there would be a lot of stuff going on at the bottom, and then this space in between um, kind of the top of the painting, the things that would go on at the top, and the things that would go on at the bottom. And a lot of times in between that space, I would put birds. And to me, as I kind of worked through why I did this, I realized that I kept putting them in that space because they kind of symbolized a connection between myself and, um, I guess, sort of the heavens or the things that... um, are larger than myself that I maybe didn't fully understand. And so when I wrote the book, I was thinking about all of those, both visually and um, metaphorically, all of those people in my life who have been those, those symbols for me. So all the different people and experiences that have been a connection for me between all of this craziness kind of down on the earth in this world that we live in um, and the more ephemeral heavenly space that we all seem drawn to but maybe can't fully grasp. It's really yeah. interesting to hear you talk sort of theoretically about it because there's not a lot of theoretical discussion in the book at all. In fact, it's it's mostly just stories. Uh, and that's what this book stands out for in the Living Faith series. Um, each book sort of reflects the background of the author who wrote it, right? So your training was in um, art and writing um, and poetry. Mm-hmm. And so we have books by like a biologist. So he talks about scientific issues. We have a book by a philosopher, so it's more philosophical um, and, and so on and so forth. So you don't get theoretical in the book itself, just telling stories. Talk about that kind of approach and how you kind of see how it fits in the series. Sure. So when I was asked to write the book, I was really, really excited at the prospect, but I also had no real concept or idea or sort of arc that I knew I wanted the book to fit under. Um, And so I knew that I 
likely had a lot to say and stories that I had to tell, but I didn't know what that would look like in a book form. And for me, again and again, that's been the lesson that's come up about this book, even in terms of the book readings, is learning to trust that space where I don't fully have a plan and don't fully know what's about to happen. And I think that's where my training as a creative writer and as a a visual artist comes in, is that the act of creation happens as you do the thing. Um, And so for me, in writing this book, um, I knew that I had a lot of memories that connected to my spirituality that I hadn't fully explored yet, or I had in some ways, but I wanted to, I kind of wanted to throw out the window all of my preconceived notions and expectations about my spirituality and just go to this creative space to ask that space what my spirituality meant for me. So I, yeah, it worked as in writing the book, the stories came out as sort of an an associative process where I would think about, like, for example, there's this memory I have of my dad. There's a piece about my dad in here, um, or several pieces, I guess, but one in particular where since I was a tiny kid, like four or five years old, I've carried around this memory of my dad like I would sit with him on the back porch every day after work and he would smoke one or two cigarettes. And I've carried that kind of image and memory around with me for 30 years. And I wasn't, like it was fine, it was just there, but I had never really asked myself, what is that? Um, And so in, in writing this book, I sat down with that memory and I worked through like, what was the actual context of that story? And I realized, um, which I never fully put together before that. Don't give it away. Let's read that one. (laughs) Oh, should we read it? Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Oh yeah. Cause I, I feel like this is a good example in the book of the generative and almost immediacy um, yeah, so you had this mental picture, this memory, and then you sat down with it and, and you're like, okay, I'm going to write about this. Where is this going to go? Yeah, so, and and one thing I think it's important to know in the book is that there is truly not a single piece in this book that I knew the ending line when I wrote the beginning line. Um, and so they were all surprising to me in really good ways. And even things that I thought I knew for sure, Um it was so nice to go back to those spaces and let them guide me rather than me being fully in charge. Okay, it's on page 25. It says, I carry a pocket full of stories about my dad. As a child, he stuck his mother's straight pins in every banana of the backyard banana tree. He once pinched my grandpa in the bottom with a pair of pliers because he just could not resist something so funny. I've heard the story a dozen times about the time he was surfing, stayed out too late and too far, and got caught in a terrible riptide against the cliffs at dusk. I revel every time he gets to the part where he thought he was done for, too weak to keep swimming, but he reached his hand up against all odds, and someone pulled him onto the shore. At 19, his parents were still holding out hope that he might turn in his mission papers, but he made art, lived in a tent in the mountains, and worked on a boat as a deckhand instead. He came home for Sunday dinners, and my grandparents loved him without reservation. When I was five, Mormon missionaries came to our house, and again when I was six and then seven. One of the images I hold dear from my childhood is my dad, after work smoking just one cigarette on the back patio while I sat on the stoop near him. Somehow, I sensed even then, during one of his last patio smokes, that he was sacrificing part of his wild self for something he thought would be good for me. He baptized my mom a year later. In the photo, he is clean-shaven and trim. His dark eyes illuminate 36 years and a hope for many good things. My proud little arms around his neck as he holds me in his white jumpsuit. My dad, a complicated, stubborn, gentle man with a knack for always coming around and doing the right thing. A surprising bouquet of flowers for my mom, kneeling tenderly next to the grandkids, teaching them how to fish. Removing the pins from the banana tree, one by one. And what a strange world when I count my memories backward and land at one. It is his imperfect face I remember first in this world. 
blurry, looking down, saying my name. It's a really great piece. There's another one that I really like too, um, that kind of connects to this. So I think in this story, your father is one of these birds. It's this figure in your life who you yeah, sort definitely. of looked above. And there, there are a number of these figures, like your mother serves as this role. There's also some missionaries who do. Um, I'm thinking of the the story about how God loves everyone. I really like that one. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, it's on uh, page 74. <laughs> it's kind of funny to read these. I'm used to like looking up and seeing people <laughs> watching me read. So it's funny to read these right now in my living room by yeah. myself. <laughs> okay. Um, a few weeks after my siblings and I were sealed to my parents in the Provo Temple, we hitched up a trailer and taped a sign on the back of our VW bus that said the Hatchapi or bust. Mother Nature welcomed us in this unremarkable California town. My brother and I spent our days in her arms, climbing trees, collecting turkey feathers, building clay pots among the oak trees. It was in Tehachapi where the missionaries drove the canyon road and our long, steep driveway each week to teach me the lessons before I was baptized. Once they asked, does God love all people or only good people? Wanting so much to impress them, I spun around once in my chair and said, only the good people. No, they said, he loves all people just the same. This last summer, I visited Tehachapi again for the first time in 25 years. I was surprised to find that the dreamlike details that had so long visited me were precise memories that led me right back up the canyon and to the foot of my old house. The driveway gate was locked, so we drove the few acres around back on the chance that the old inhabited trailer that belonged to a neighbor was still there. A family came curious onto the rutted dirt drive. We asked if we could peek through their fence at my childhood home and property. Of course, they said from the trailer that was still standing and housing people two decades later. It was dilapidated with various shanty-like add-ons, while a small girl holding a scruffy stuffed rabbit stood between her pregnant mother and father, who wore a baseball cap over his sandy hair. The little girl approached my children as we walked across the uneven front yard made of dirt and roots, and soon the three of them were talking as if all children in the world were at some time, not so long ago, already friends. They were so kind, and my husband and I cried as we drove away about the sacredness of life, even in the unseen and unsightly pockets of this world. Ten minutes before, as I peered through the fence, I swear I saw the ghost of my seven-year-old self playing next to my round-faced brother, Con contemplating what it meant that God really loves all people just the same. I still remember when you uh, when you sent that piece in, and I think it was fairly early on, and you'd sent... That was one of the first ones I remember seeing uh, of your childhood. It was so interesting to see you bring in this experience that you had that it kind of collapses time like it's talking about your childhood but the story's about when you went back to see that place that was a really interesting way i think to tell that story yeah i mean it it actually did feel like time had collapsed when i went back and everything was the same i feel like it, th that kind of is representative of the book in general because you're you're telling a lot of stories about the past most i think Maybe all of them are, are about some sort of memory, but it's such a present book. All of the stories that you tell are filtered through the last 12 months when you when you wrote the book. Yeah, which is fascinating to me because I feel like, and fascinating, but I think also so encouraging and exciting to me theologically that were I to write this book now, these memories would probably carry even different things. And were I to write this book five years from now with the same memories, they would also, like there would be different things that would come up. And so to me, that makes me really excited about my own possibility for an evolving spirituality and that I'm not being asked to tell the same story or the right story. Um, I'm being asked to be curious and to just to figure out what things mean as I go and that they will likely mean different things at different times. And that's totally not just okay, but like exciting and 
Um, it's this process of faith. I take it as one of the main themes of the book. And again, you never spell any of this out. It just happens in the course of the stories is how how immediate our testimonies are you know to use like the lds parlance this idea of our faith being so present to us in this moment and that means that by definition it will be adaptable or it has to be adaptable if it's going to survive um, because we continue to grow and learn and change and and the lessons that you take from these stories now like you said uh could be different if you wrote this book again in a year. Yeah, and actually Adam Miller says something that I really like about that um, in Letters to a Young Mormon. Um, he says, Jesus is not asking you to tell a better story or live your story more successfully. He's asking you to lose that story. Um, and I think that really is one of the main parts of the book. I listened to this really great talk at a conference from this guy who was talking about spiritual writing and he talked about the difference between spiritual autobiography and spiritual memoir. And he talked about spiritual autobiography being this story where we know exactly where the character will end up. And we want we watch them like pass these checkpoints. Yeah, they're conversion and, or deconversion narratives usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And so and we kind of as readers, they can be satisfying because in some ways they prove us right. Mm hmm. And I think we particularly do this in Mormonism, like, oh, they're going to get baptized and we know what they're going to feel. And like, we are very gratified by that. Um, and so there is a place and a time for those autobiographies. But he said spiritual memoir, on the other hand, is something that unfolds itself completely. And the, the actual act of writing is the spiritual experience. And he the the guy speaking talked about like the act of writing opening you up to another dimension which is pretty big language <laughs> but in many ways i feel like that is such a truth that in writing this like i feel like i was uncovering and opening doors that were deep inside me and sometimes i would even write the first draft of the story as the thing I thought I was supposed to tell um, and probably as the thing that would be considered spiritual autobiography and then I would sit down and I would listen and just be really quiet and say and now tell this a lot more honestly and I feel like in doing that that's when pieces like the one that just happened came up where when I could be quiet and be totally honest with um, with my not knowing and with maybe my uncertainty and my like being totally humble and saying like I actually don't have an answer and I don't know what this means and I'm all right with that I think that's when good things happen for me. Yeah, those are like there's so there's two big things there. Um, on the one hand, you're talking about the uncertainty that exists in the book, and on the other, you're talking about the value of writing for spirituality. And I would even say it sounds like you're talking about a revelatory process. When uh, Mormons talk about personal revelation, um, a lot of times we think of it in terms of these propositional truths that we ask: Is this particular thing true? And then we get an answer that it is, or something like that. But other people. The, the other way is like personal revelation that might prompt you to do something or to be somewhere. Uh, with yours, the, it's kind of a subset of those where it's it's just helping you understand your past and your connection to other people in, in new ways. So it, it's like this kind of personal revelation that's come out through this writing that you did mm -hmm. uh, is very individual, but always connected to other people. Um, yeah. It, yes. I like the word revelatory a lot. And I think that's that's something that definitely has come about for me is that honestly, and you can attest to this, I w before writing this book, I was not confident. Um, I was not confident in taking up space. I was not confident in using my voice or a lot of the things that I thought. Um, I carried a lot of anxiety about those things. And I think in part because I didn't yet trust my own process and capability for self-revelation. 
Can I just say that that was fa- that's fascinating for me to hear? Like when when you talked to me about this more recently, because at the time, I and mean, when we started, I'd seen samples of your writing; it was outstanding, and I never would have guessed that there were any sort of um, confidence issues. And so, occasionally, when you would sort of have a difficult time, and you'd email me and sort of like, uh, mm-hmm. you know, is this is. Am I doing this or, you know, it was, it was a big surprise to me because it seemed to me that you had this skill. So that, that, that came as such a surprise when you had those moments. Yeah. Well, and I think it, I mean, I don't, I, I want to go back to the, the revelatory question, but I think this also ties in is that it has so much to do with me being a young female in a patriarchal church. And it's a culmination of so many things and partly my own misinterpretations of like what humility means. And I think often, like as women, we're taught that one of our greatest assets and one of the things that we can, that we should cultivate is our humility and our selflessness and kind of our, our charity equaling giving everything away and kind of completely losing ourselves and I think I had taken that to an extreme um, in believing that by taking up space I was not being charitable and yeah like there's a way to serve that can actually devalue the self in a negative way rather than you know there's that scripture that says you know whosoever lose their their life for my sake shall find it that can be that can be taken in a way that would say completely erase yourself Mm-hmm. And I, I think that can be a problem, as you said, especially culturally for some um, members of the LDS Church, where uh, women might feel to erase themselves or to be to go in the background and and believe that that is itself a form of service, uh, mm-hmm. rather than you know. Yeah, yeah, and in part, I mean, I've been to graduate school. I'm smart and capable, but I'm also a stay-at-home mom right yeah. now, and I feel like I I carried the weight of that stipulation way too much at the forefront Mm -hmm. of what I was doing. And particularly because the people writing books before me in this series were men with PhDs who were older and very successful in whatever they're doing um, in terms of academia, one's a doctor. um, And so I thought, what could I possibly have to offer as a stay-at-home mom? Which I think, again, goes back to the revelatory question where as I, after I finished the book, I realized, no, I could not have written this book without doing the things that I've done for the past five years since I have been a stay-at-home mom. Um, and that work is not less valuable and not even less intellectually stimulating than a lot of like say, had I been in an academic trap right. position. Um, and so I think they both have value. Um, but spiritually, I think as women and as like Mormon women, as many of us are stay-at-home moms, we don't give credence to our own spiritual thoughts and spiritual intellectualism. Yeah, so like two things, like you felt, so there's a certain spiritual constraining that can happen, like your revelation can actually be blocked certain possibilities of revelation could be blocked based on cultural assumptions. Your book is trying yes. to break those open. And then also within the context of the series itself, like you have academic training. The idea of the series is to take a, a scholar or someone who's earned a degree and say, what kind of book would happen uh, is a combination of their degree and their Mormonism. And and yours was unique. As you said, these other uh, men in the series have PhDs or they're, you know, in history or medicine or whatever, philosophy uh, and, and this sort of thing. You, your training, your academic training has impacted the type of stay-at-home mom that you've been. And you've also worked and done other jobs as well, like, you know, yeah. as a teacher, things like this. But, but the idea is like your training has also informed that too. So in, in giving this book to people and making this book available, we're, we, I sort of wanted to show the value of the training that you received um, you didn't hop right you know you didn't go straight from high school to becoming a mom and not having any jobs or anything like that and then you know and when some people do that and that works really well for them but this also shows the value of a different way of doing things and I think mm-hmm. that your motherhood's been informed by your training your stories definitely show that um, and your stories are obviously informed by the craft as well so there's like a there there are different ways that that the book fits into the series that's true to the series as like an academic exploration of Mormonism 
Uh, mm-hmm. But it's custom to you. Like, this is your voice. This is your experience. This is the kind of book that happens when we take someone with an MFA and ask them to write for members of the church. So it couldn't have been any other way. Like, your experiences created this book. Um, but I like how you call attention to the limitations of your personal revelation that have happened culturally that you've through the process of writing this, have sort of had to come to reckon with. And I get the sense that from conversations we had about some of your book events, that there were people in the audience who were really tuned into this. And they would say, like, you you seem so confident. At the same time, your book has so many questions in it. And how are you so confident? And and how do you do that when your book has a lot of uncertainty in it? So let's talk a little bit about that, too. It's sort of connected to what we've been talking about. Sure. Yes. So in terms of, I guess I would say that is actually the most common. I'm taking it as a compliment and I think people (laughs) meant it that way. Um, But so many people said you seem really, really comfortable in your own skin and you seem incredibly confident. Um, And one person in one of the questions asked, she said, you say so often that you don't know exactly And she said that phrase of not knowing exactly and saying that so confidently and not as an apology, but saying it assertively and positively. And she asked, like, how do you get to that place? Because I don't know a lot of things exactly. And I've, whether it's been learned or I don't know how we get to that place, but um, this this particular woman said, for me, that's I've always thought of that as a negative of not knowing things exactly. Um, and there's a quote I need I don't know who it's by, and I should, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, <laughs> but it's the opposite of faith is not doubt but certainty. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that is probably a large theme throughout this book. Yeah. There's a piece that actually speaks to this. It's on page 73. I wrote it down here. Um, but I thought it would be cool to have you read that. I, my guess is that the, you may have even read this very piece. This is one that I think would prompt just those sort of comments. Yeah, definitely. So I'll read it on page 73. <clears throat> what I want to tell you as you read this, these stories is that I've both found and lost God a hundred times over. In fact, maybe I've never actually found God at all. But imagining that I have indeed found something so much larger and more beautiful than I can explain is most often enough for me. I believe that somewhere in all this, we belong to parents who love us with that fierce and tender love reserved for the moments when you observe a child trying their best at something. I believe we have parents who are as proud of us as I felt of Remy and Thea, when despite the briskness of the afternoon, they tore off their clothes and went running across the sand and into the cold Northern California waves in pursuit of all the beauty and delight this world may have to offer. When I looked out over the ocean, the waves crashing against the faraway rocks, a pelican soaring wordlessly through the blue sky, I saw for a brief moment the incomprehensible largeness of the place with infinite beginnings and endings both behind and in front of me. I both found and lost God a hundred times over. I sense a powerful parental guiding love from heaven. I think it feels like the joy I felt when I set down all I had been carrying and ran out to my children, letting the cold waves crash over us, holding their hands when the waves tugged at our feet, the sand crabs leaving bubbling holes as they dove into the wet sand. My daughter lifted her feet and let the water pull her out while I lifted her. For me, Mormonism does not provide the ease of certain answers. It provides a language and the impetus to write about an afternoon on a beach and truly believe that maybe for a moment I had found God or else something perhaps is holy, godliness. That piece is so striking. And I remember when you first sent it in, I remember the line that stuck out to me the most was right at the beginning where you say, in fact, maybe I've never actually found God at all. And that's such a stunning thing to read. Talk a little bit about that line and how it fits into the overall piece. Uh, Sure. For me, one of the huge paradigm shifts that's happened over the course of the past year in writing and reading and talking about this book is before I had this sense of God, and particularly a male God, um, as this parent who had something really specific that he wanted me to do. And I 
thought of my job as like deciphering what that specific thing was and then carrying it out precisely in the way that God wanted me to carry it out. And turns out that's a really hard thing to do. Like I would never expect my children to somehow figure out the thing that I wanted them to do and then carry it out in the way that I wanted them to carry it out. Like it just, I wouldn't do that. And for, But for some reason I pictured God is that way for a long time. And so I think in the writing of this book and particularly with lines like that, uh, my paradigm changed in that all of a sudden I, I realized that I was not being expected to do something specific, um, but rather that I was really supported supported and encouraged to be creative and to do things in the way that I best knew how. Like use your gifts. Like you have these, it's yeah. not so, so directed. Yeah. And so in that line, um, maybe I've found God and maybe I haven't, um, did not feel like closure on God or rejection of God. Um, in a lot of ways, it felt like a collaboration with God of like, hey, I have these really large questions and I'm working them out um, and here's how I'm doing it. And instead of feeling like, how dare you like wonder if I'm there or not, <laughs> um, it felt like, yeah, like it's a great question to ask. I'm glad you're working through it. And so for me, I, I just, I felt really uh, I guess supported would be the right word through the both by like very earthly people um, and but also by like this spiritual sense of like we I felt trusted to do to do the things that I was doing. It's rather an openness to learn more about God uh, 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 and you know instead of having a finished story about God to be open to learning more about the whole situation. And I love the imagery that you use of your children in this story where um, <laughs> it seems like they're doing something crazy. Like kids do these funny things like, you know, it's cold and they're, they're running out into the water and they're being spontaneous. And I see you as a God figure in this story, like looking on at these beautiful kids with such pride and like wanting to get involved. And, like, you join them out there. So when you're talking about like, you know, you, you've, you're not sure you found God. Like you're, you're seeing this as a God figure yourself. Like, does that make sense? Like, you mm, yeah, yes. I think that's a that's a really nice way to put it, and to put it specifically in context. That I'm like that God is not not a dictator. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it goes back to the revelatory question in terms of like working through um, the idea of a heavenly mother. Like, I think for so long we've been told we can't know more about her. We will likely never know more about her. Um, but I feel like this book taught me, like, uh, no, you actually can. Like, you, if you would like to know more about her, go for it. And I, I think, again, feeling trusted to do that. Um, and that's not unique to me. Yeah, at all. It's, it was really uh, comforting to me, like, as the editor, to see the church putting out these great gospel topics essays, one of them in particular about Heavenly Mother, um, to see an, an uptick in in references to Heavenly Mother in general conferences. And that really opened the door for places like the Maxwell Institute to, you know, and BYU Studies has published on on, on this, to, to acknowledge that and to explore it a little bit. Um, so there's some really profound pieces in the book that do that. And uh, I, I think a lot of people will be able to appreciate that. It seems like the church is coming to a place where that's definitely um, definitely on the table. Like we can look at that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember I'm, I really am so grateful that um, things like the Heavenly Mother's to Gospel to Topics essays and all the things you just mentioned. But I do remember one line um, in that Gospel Topics essay um, that said, um, we have, like, we don't know a lot about, it said something along the lines, we don't know a lot about her, but what we have is sufficient. And I remember thinking, like, mm, it doesn't feel very sufficient to me. Like, I actually am not satisfied with <laughs> um, my relationship with her at this point, because I did not even speak her name until I was in college. 
And so I think in part taking accountability and responsibility for that in writing this book and saying, like just recognizing that she is definitely a figure that is available for knowing um, and it's likely not going to come through our typical avenues. But I think it is a very personal endeavor um, and quite open to interpretation. And I think that's okay. Like until we personally feel like it's sufficient, um, we don't need anybody else to tell us what we have is sufficient. So for me, well, maybe I can read a, a piece, one of the, the opening piece in the book, I feel like is a good example of, or you can read another one. The one with your mom, if you could oh, read man. that one. <laughs> I might have to have you read that one. <laughs> that would actually be really funny. Because um, <laughs> isn't that uh, the maturation one? Yep. Uh, I honestly don't know if I can read it. I might just cry through it. For some reason, it's one of the few pieces that I just kind of have a hard time getting through. It's it's one of the most powerful in the book, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can I ask you to read it? You want me to? Okay. <laughs> so that people don't have to suffer through my um, tears. As... Okay. So, yeah, I'll read this. This is this will be really interesting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> At my fifth grade maturation program, my sweaty kid knees against the metal folding chair, my mom reached over and took my hand. I felt stricken with embarrassment as a delighted volunteer mother held two ripe and reddened grapefruit to her chest and joked about the breasts that we would have one day. I wanted to shrink into the orange carpet of the library floor and the talk of blood and bodies, the old VHS tape whirring in the VCR, my mom holding my limp hand in her lap. I did not want to become a woman. No one had ever explained to me much about womanhood, and I equated the call with things that scared me and things I did not want. No one told me that my body was a brilliant temple, that although it might be capable of creating life, it was certainly capable of creating important thoughts and ideas and change. I can only guess no one had ever told my own mother those things either, even after she had accomplished them all. I prayed I would never start my period, and when I did, I felt so betrayed that I cried so hard and so long that my mom did not send me to school, but instead sat with me a long time at the edge of her bed, she in just a towel still wet from the shower. My mom's own mother died when she was just 15, and because I am the oldest, my mom and I spent our first 30 years together, setting out like stalwart pioneers as we attempted to navigate the landscape of a mother-daughter relationship. We had no examples to model ourselves after, no lessons or manuals to teach us how to be mother and daughter. My mom and I got on well for 30 years with overflowing amounts of love and kindness exchanged, but it was not until a recent snapping cold winter day when I saw her unloading the car on the driveway after a day of work at the hospital as a nurse that something changed. I'd been keeping a notebook of times I felt heavenly mother, of things she might want to tell me, of ways I might better know her, I did not expect her, however, to illuminate my own mother in such a way that as I watched her load the groceries, a few bags in each arm, and as I ran down the steps to help her, she was strong and glorious in a way I had not noticed before. I wanted to go back and help that fifth grade girl hold her mother's hand firmly in an unspoken pact that promised we would work harder to learn from a heavenly mother as well as a heavenly father so we could know better how to love each other. Thank you. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, nobody should probably have to read in public pieces about their mom. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's just, uh, well, how, what was it like yeah. writing it then? I mean, uh, you know, if it's, I get that it is harder to read something, but in terms of writing it, how was that? Uh, I mean, I just cried. And, I mean, I guess in part because, like I said, like none of these pieces – um, I wrote exactly knowing where they would go. So again, that memory of my maturation program, mm -hmm. which was slightly uh, still stressful to me because I, I just hated it. Like it, it was not a good experience for me, um, but I knew like that was there and I wanted to write about it, but I had no idea uh where it would take me. Mm -hmm. So I started writing about this maturation program and 
I hadn't connected before that image with the image of my mom unloading groceries. Which seems day. like such a mundane thing. Yeah, which it really is. And I, and so then all of a sudden, I think it's another one of those moments where time sort of collapses. Mm -hmm. And this idea, I think the most important line to me in that, or one of the most important, is um, like recognizing that nobody had ever taught us how to be... Like, I've never seen an example of how you act with the mom. Mm -hmm. um, there are countless examples of, like, this is how you talk to your Heavenly Father. This is how you love him. This is how you obey him. But I've never seen any of that with a mom. And so so I guess in, in writing it, yeah, like, I, I, I think I was down in, like, the laundry room um, basement by myself. <laughs> and just, like... <laughs> And, and just like crying that as like, as I, as I worked through and recognized, I guess a lot of things that I have been missing for my whole life. And so again, I think that is the value of not just me writing, but all of us actually writing through these stories, um, because I could not have articulated that in conversation to anyone else. Mm -hmm. I couldn't have wrapped my head around, like I would not have made the connections between those images if I had just thought them through. Um, yeah, I mean, I, reading it made me want to write. Like I, I started writing a little, just a little journal thing about my kids, like a couple, like, like they did this today or they did that today. Like it, your book made me want to write. Good. <laughs> yeah, and and that's, I guess, <laughs> because I don't, often have like a platform to give advice <laughs> i've been taking <laughs> advantage of having that platform well actually i do every day to my kids but yeah. they don't listen so <laughs> um, two people are actually attentive to that um i would say i really really um and i want to be transparent in this i hope that the thing that happens when people read this book is that they not just say like oh she has a really nice story but, oh, I likely have a really important story. Um, and I don't know what that is. And I don't know how that will come about. Um, but even like my brother-in-law, who just went through a really, really rough divorce um, after 11 years of marriage, told me that um, after reading, and he came to one of the book readings, um, he sat down and he he wanted his kids to know um, the story of their parents' marriage. Um, and I mean, not, not just that it ended in divorce, but that they, that both spiritually and temporally and um, figuratively, they came from a place of a lot of love. Mm -hmm. um, and so he said it was so helpful to him to sit down and write um, and not feel like he had to tell a chronological story, not that, and he said it was interesting to him to all of a sudden take moments that, um, or events that had lasted like over the course of a couple months and write them in a single paragraph. Um, and that he was no longer beholden even specifically to like the exact, um, accurate historical details but that he was beholden now to the story he was telling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very freeing form, yeah. Yeah, so I do hope that that's what – I hope that happens. Yeah, I think I think it will. I mean, I've heard other people say it. Um, they read the book and they, they just feel sort of impressed to start writing. I think it's so important for everyone to write, but I would say for women to write um, because we historically have been the most quiet in the church – I think that's one reason we want, like, this is not a book for women. Like this, th no. it's, you know, definitely yeah. women can read this, but we, all along we've, the project has been conceived of as something that, that we would both want uh, men and women to read. Uh, yes, and, definitely. And in order for more men to hear women's voices, we want more women writing. We want more women in the conversation. And so there's, you know, but, it, but it's for everybody's benefit. It's not, it's not for either men or women's benefit alone. Yeah. Yeah, I had an interesting experience. I don't know, maybe I can say this, maybe I can't. Um, <laughs> where, um, well, now people have was, turned up the volume. So <laughs> There was some guy on Facebook who 
um, somebody had written a piece about why men should read this book. And this guy, I don't know who he was, um, commented and said, this article is not enough to convince me. I want to be convinced why I should, why I as a man should read this book by a woman. Um, and I just responded to him and I said, I absolutely will not convince you to read my book because never in my life has a man had to convince me as a woman why I should read his book. And I think like, and, and he was a very rare case, but it kind of struck me as like, there's still work to do. Yeah. Like there is definitely still work to do. And, and truly I have not experienced that almost at all in particular with the Maxwell Institute. Um, there's been nothing but support um, and kindness and, and even like support when I maybe wanted to quit and everybody <laughs> said, no, you're not going to. Like, <laughs> well, it's funny because like, you know, all it's been 10 years that the Institute's been around and, and you're the first book that was written by a woman that, that we've published. We were so excited to see this project come about. Like, it's something that we both celebrate and mourn like at the same time, like it, it shouldn't <laughs> have taken till 2016, but we're so glad that this book has done that. And we want to see more of that. Yeah, no, and it, and actually somebody asked me at one of the readings how um, the Maxwell Institute has responded, and I said, truly, they ha like there has been nothing but kindness and support, even down to, um, like, when I told you at my first book release event, I would like a dance party and lots of homemade bread and lots of decorations, <laughs> and there was no sense of, like, what? Like, you're going to have a dance party? Everyone just said, yeah. Probably a good idea. Um, <laughs> and so I think this, um, I don't know if assertive is the right word, but just a willingness to take up space in a more feminine way um, and recognizing that that is happily received and that I think sometimes as women, we, we want to feel like, oh, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be like, and, and sometimes there definitely is, but there's also so many places where, like, the church as an institution is ready and willing for that. Speaking of um, working with the Maxwell Institute, another uh, question that I've seen come up is is sort of people wonder about the purpose of the book. Um, some people have asked why it doesn't dig more into the sort of faith crisis narrative. You actually reframe that as more of an opportunity for creativity than than crisis in particular and there have been questions about that so i mean what have you tried to explain to people when that comes up um and that definitely is it's a valid criticism question of in many ways i sidestep a lot of the typical um challenges that come along with a faith crisis um and I, it, like, I am very aware of those challenges, um, and not just aware of them, but have like spent a decade grappling pretty intensely with them. Um, I feel like more and more, I'm interested in writing about my Mormon experience in ways that can travel beyond a Mormon experience. Like, in part, as I thought about my audience for this book, um, so many, I like, a vast majority of my closest friends and family members are no longer Mormon. And for whatever reason, they've, they've left or are no longer a part. And many of my relatives are not Mormon and never were. And so, and, and those were the people, many of the people that I'm writing about are those particular characters. And so in writing it, it felt so myopic to quickly delve into the real specifics of something like a, a faith crisis, um, in part because the language is quite exclusive. And it's and, already tied to a pretty well laid out narrative as well. Like that story has been yes. told, it will be told, uh, it'll continue to be told. Yeah, and in part, um, like I have lived a good part of the last decade since coming home from my mission um, in at times like in serious faith crisis mode. And it was during a lot of those times when I, I 
did not find answers to the questions that I had. And in part, it left me pretty unhappy spiritually and feeling pretty frustrated. And and I knew, um, I feel like I've kind of, I've come to this place where, no, I have not solved the things that are difficult. Um, and I'm okay with that because I feel like there's something more beautiful on the other side of that. Um, and something that feels far more intellectually interesting to me, theologically interesting, um, and, and and something that I'm much more able to engage with. Um, and so I feel like, I guess I'm not interested in in my Mormonism because my human experience gives me a lens to understand my Mormonism better, um, but rather I'm interested in Mormonism because it it gives me a better lens to understand a more diverse and vast human experience better, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, one of the themes that runs throughout is like claiming your own voice. And, uh, you know, we're always selective about um, about how I think how we speak and, and what we talk about and when we do it and how we do it. I'm thinking about the piece on page 177, the letter to oh, yeah. your daughter, Thea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think part of this book, um, and then this goes along with the piece, is I feel like having to, uh, I don't know that bravery is the right word because I didn't necessarily feel brave, um, but maybe just being comfortable in being completely honest, both about the difficulty, but I think one thing that we sometimes discount in the church is that, like, that's a pretty, like, maybe a revered place to be completely honest about the difficulty, but on the flip side of that, um, there's something really important and maybe needed, um, about being totally honest about the beauty in things um, and about despite like the churches and institution being imperfect, there's a lot of really beautiful things that come from that. And so I think both voices um, deserve to come to the surface Mm -hmm. um, and should be allowed equal playing time. Um, So, <clears throat> this piece, letter from my daughter, Thea. For my birthday, we went to the beach. Not a sandy beach, but a secret rocky beach down a path rife with poison oak that we jumped over. The day was a little bit foggy, a little bit colorless, a little bit cold. I walked along behind Carl, Remy, and you, stopping to pick up a fossil of a shell, a piece of abalone, a memory of my son looking out into the vast ocean. We had been collecting quietly, sliding over wet rocks, filling our pockets with treasure for almost an hour, when you, all of your three years, came and sat next to me. I noticed your little palm was tightly shut, and when I asked what you had, you opened your hand to reveal a dozen carefully selected round pebbles. You have a propensity for treasuring small, spherical objects, and I welled up with intense pride and love as I pictured you, my devout little girl, searching, examining, holding on to the very best things without even the intention to show me unless I asked. Thea, as a girl, it was hard for me to speak out of fear for saying the wrong thing, or fear of being too bold or even too soft. As a grown woman, it is sometimes even more difficult. But please let your wandering spiritual impressions take shape, and then give them a voice, even if they happen between the odd hours of making casseroles and bathing children, or on the days of feeling alone and without direction, in a workspace or through sleepless nights. Speak, even when you are sure there is someone smarter and more informed than you in the room. Give credence to your spiritual ideas. Allow a bit of chaos to reign within your thoughts. And then let that unexpected happiness spill into the spaces around you. Your story carries power. Your experience is valid. Your voice is vital. I think back on that moment on the beach, and I want so much for your first impulse, not to be simply to siphon away the palm full of precious and strong pebbles that miraculously tumbled to you from a vast and completely wild earth. I want your first impulse to be to open your hand and talk about how you found them, to let them shine out like rising firelight on a dark hillside. 
That is a great piece. <laughs> That's <laughs> Thank <you>. really good. <laughs> And I should say too, this is this is Ashley May Hoyland. I haven't been doing my typical uh, <laughs> bumpers here because I've just been wrapped up in the conversation. But Ashley May Hoyland, she's the author of the book One Hundred Birds Taught Me to Fly, that came out uh, November of 2016. Came out last month uh, from the Maxwell Institute. Before we go to, uh, there's another piece that I wanted you to read. There, there's a ton of other stuff. Like we talked about before the interview, what we wanted to talk about, and of course, we only ended up getting to. <laughs> <laughs> some of it uh yeah but let let's do um that rainbow piece uh oh sure at the very end yeah this is on page 199 in 1989 a rainbow fell across the sky in our little neighborhood on the hill i stood on the ledge of the bathtub and curled my fingers on the window sill to pull my scrawny body up to see i could hear voices cadenced and sturdy through the open window the rainbow was brighter than any rainbow I have seen since, the sky more orange and close. The fresh petals on asphalt reflected two shimmering missionaries, press shirts and black pants, my mom, my dad, my little white-haired brother between them, and somewhere in the background, me watching it all, documenting the magic, cataloging it for some future time. Surely they all came inside to eat dinner then, and I reached up on my tiptoes and pulled on my best dress, <clears throat> because I always did when the missionaries came, and we must have all celebrated my mom. After years of attending church on and off, of listening to missionaries, of wondering, of wondering, she decided to be baptized, and my dad had decided to come back to be the one to baptize her. I do not know what changed for my mom, except that she has spoken many times about the way the people at church loved her, even before she was a documented part of them. In recent years, the memory of a conversation I am not sure I was supposed to hear at my Catholic aunt's house when she found out the news had resurfaced. My aunt was crying and asking my mom to reconsider, and my mom said, I am happy, I am happy, you don't need to worry. I must have stitched those words into the part of me that wants so much to stay with the gospel of my upbringing. We were in this together from the beginning, my parents, my brothers, sisters yet to come, the missionaries and I, that ancient brand new rainbow emerging bright and triumphant after what must have been a rainstorm. Well, I appreciate you reading through those pieces uh, yeah. and taking the time today to, to do the interview. Uh, it's a hard one to do just because I've been so close to the projects. Yeah, and I feel like I, I should definitely acknowledge, I feel like um, in terms of like, again, talking about the title, this has felt, even though I wrote the words to the book, it has felt like such a collaborative process. Like, I hope you take ownership if you want. <laughs> I won't make you. <laughs> but, but if, like, I hope you feel an ownership to this book and to these stories. Um, because uh, it, it definitely doesn't see, feel like a singular project in any way. No, I love this book. I, I think what you've done is magnificent. I, I really, uh, I'm so happy to, and thankful that I had the opportunity to work with you and, and to like, just see this come into shape has been amazing. So I hope that, uh, I hope people will take the time to check it out. Um, I think it will be more than worth their time. I think this book is a powerful way of helping prompt an, a, a really fruitful exploration of our spirituality. And, um, and it, it speaks a lot to me of the value of the creative arts in doing that. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that's why when I see this in the Living Faith series, uh, I, I see that that's kind of the main angle I see, the value of that type of approach to life and education. Um, results in something amazing that so many people can benefit from. So thank you for yeah, thank bringing you. your gifts to you, to the series. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And we should say also, um, if people do, um, won't ever use this in book groups or just on your own, um, you've created that really nice, uh, PDF. Yeah. We came up with questions and put them in a book club discussion document that people can download from the Maxwell Institute's website just on your book's web page. Um, it's in PDF. It's also like in a mobile format, so you can look at it on your phone really easily. Uh, yeah, and it's got some really great questions we came up with um, sort of spark discussion. So 
Yeah. And people should also know about your We Brave Women cards that, that are available on your website. Um, they're your own art with uh, stories about amazing women um, from history and amazing women from all sorts of different uh, countries and professions. And my four-year-old daughter loves them. So people yeah, definitely want you. to check that stuff out and other stuff. I think your website's ashmay.com. Yes, ashmay.com. Yep. So people can check that out. And of course, the book is 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly uh, from the Maxwell Institute. It's available at Amazon and Deseret Book and other places like that. So uh, Ashmay, thanks so much for coming on yeah, the Maxwell Institute you. podcast. Yeah. Thank you.